Whenever we start talking about privacy, I love to start with this quote from Scott McNeely, who was the former chief executive of Sun Microsystems. And he says, you have zero privacy anyway, so get over it. And I think um, privacy certainly has different meanings uh, to different people um, in our online environment. But let's take a look at the foundations of privacy and um, kind of how it's been shaped from a legal perspective. Um, I hate to break the news to you, but privacy is not a constitutional uh, guarantee. So we have a couple amendments that will provide us with some idea of privacy, but really it takes some interpretation. Um, in this case, we have the Fourth Amendment, which says that people have the right to be secure in their homes um, against unreasonable search and seizure, and that has been deemed to protect us. Um, and then this Third Amendment, that soldiers can't be in your home unless it's wartime, is another one uh, where we have looked at that as a privacy provision. I have to ask though, what does privacy mean now? Um, you know, we, we put so many things online, um, pictures, uh, our activities, our location, um, our histories, our birthdays, all of these things that, that would be considered to be private information is now out there. Um, the idea of cookies, uh, I, I recently searched for a hockey helmet for my son and I'm intrigued how every time I'm on Facebook, it offers to sell me a hockey helmet. Um, I, I only need one though. So, um, you know, the idea of, of the fact that I can, uh, my location is trackable through my smartphone, um, that I put my location on Twitter, um, you know, people are checking in using things like Foursquare. What about, you know, your, your online activities in the workplace, the online banking that you do? Um, what about information revealed by minors? You know, all of this really comes into question what we're going to do about privacy. So the sources of our present privacy protection actually gets incorporated into that word of liberty. Um, it's been determined by the court that liberty includes personal privacy. Um, we have a great deal of protection within the framework of the bedroom, so uh, things about contraception and uh, abortion, things like that, have all been uh, fitted under this privacy realm. Um, but we have not a great deal of protection against the media or the government or any um, other snooping that might go on. Now, privacy law begins uh, in the 1890s in the Harvard Law Review when uh, Samuel Warren and Louis Brandeis uh, said that human dignity requires protecting individual rights. And the area of privacy law was really flushed out by William Prosser in, this, in 1960, where he identified these four privacy categories um, that you may have heard of. One, appropriation. Uh, that's the idea of taking someone's name or likeness for trade purposes to make money off of it. Um, the idea of intrusion upon seclusion, so actually intruding upon someone's privacy. The public disclosure of private facts, so things that we would like to keep private that are revealed uh, without our permission. And and then false light, which uh, we'll certainly dig a little deeper into, uh, but where you're basically revealed to be a person that you're not. Now, appropriation means two different things really to two different types of people. Uh, the first type of person would be someone like you and me, who um, we're just living our life and, and someone takes our name or our picture or our voice or something like that, and they use it in order to make money for themselves. That is appropriating our image. Um, the other uh, category would be people who are famous, and they actually have a right of publicity. So they have a right to make money off their own image, and if someone were to come along and uh, do, by taking their name or picture, picture, voice, etc., um, and make money off themselves and it causes economic harm, that's also a violation under this. Now the case that I want to talk to you about here is this one where we have a gentleman who uh, turns out that his insurance company or an insurance company had used a before and after picture of him to illustrate someone who bought life insurance. Um, so he ends up suing them and the court found that this violated both the First and the Fourth Amendment for him, that uh, he had the right not to be engaged or to be identified as being part of this product. So what we really kind of weigh is this privacy versus publicity. So private people have a right of privacy. This uh, protects us from the emotional damage that can be caused when our name or likeness is used for commercial or trade purposes. And then as we mentioned, this right of publicity. So this is if, if I'm going to get uh, be uh, I'm a famous person, I have the ability to have my um, likeness used and be compensated for that. So only with commercial value is someone able to claim the right of publicity. 
there are actually exemptions to this um, and protections for us. One, the idea of news or information. So if we, um, uh, for example, when um, a celebrity is in a car accident and there's a photo that's run in the paper, they can't claim a right of publicity that they need to be compensated in some way. Um, also consent. So um, you can actually uh, get consent from people. And so a lot of times what we'll have are model releases or uh, people you, you may have signed in the past some sort of consent that says, yes, you can use my image to promote um, your activity or, you know, because I'm part of it. Um, and then there's something called incidental use, the idea that there's a fleeting or brief use permitted. So if you're a face in the crowd of, um, you're at a festival and the next year they use a picture to promote their festival, you happen to be in that group, you can't turn around and, and claim uh, uh, that you now should be compensated for that. We also uh, have something called the Booth Rule. And that comes into play here with a woman named Shirley Booth versus Curtis Publishing, which published a variety of magazines, uh, Saturday Evening Post for one, in this case, Holiday Magazine. So they actually had done an article on her. She was uh, quite a famous actress at the time. She was, uh, they had a photo of her vacationing in Jamaica. So she consents to the article, but then when they turn around and use the same photo to promote their magazine, she sues. And what the court says is that um, the advertising was doing nothing more than uh, an incidental use as it related to promoting the magazine and she'd already given permission to use the photo in the first place. Now consent doesn't work all the time and so just because you've given consent once doesn't mean that you can give it again. So you know think about someone who maybe was in a band um, you know if, if uh, they, they were in a, in a small band when they were in high school and they give consent for their image to be used uh, for something and then they suddenly become quite famous. So if it was you know 21 Pilots or Rascal Flats or someone like that locally um, and then they they become famous we can't use their image in quite the same way. Also, people, uh, not everyone can give consent, so minors cannot give consent for themselves. That requires uh, parental consent. Uh, people who are mentally ill also are protected and cannot give consent. And then uh, people who are incarcerated also have protections. Um, and, and that idea of consent can also be lost if you do something to substantially change the image. So if you take someone's face and put it on someone else's body, that level of consent no longer is applicable.